the, any of mine. You'll get plenty from everybody else, though. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you pray for us. We'll be on the road tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, taking off. You should pray for them, too. You should pray for them, especially. Yeah, I know you all too well. He's right, though. You better pray for them. But um, it'll be a good trip. Looking forward to it. And In fact, there's a brother in... Well, actually, he's three and a half hours away. We're going to be going into Champaign, Illinois. You know where that is, Brother, Brother Lee? Yeah. yeah, I've been there a few times. I think. I don't remember. I don't remember a lot about the 90s. But anyway, I was over there. I've been over there before in that area. I used to work kind of in that area a little bit all around the state there. But um, we're going to be pulling in there tomorrow night sometime. And this brother is about three and a half hours from there. And he wants to drive down to meet us. Um, he listens to our preaching all the time. And uh, he's been blessed by our, our church. And uh, I believe he got saved under, this, under the ministry from listening online. And uh, he wants to meet us when we get to Champaign and take us all out for dinner and uh, spend some time with us there before we head off to our hotel. So that's a blessing. And we look forward to meeting with him. I've, I've talked to him a few times. I corresponded through email. And, and that, and uh, he was just excited that we were going to be that close. And I was just, I was very humbled at the fact that he would drive three and a half hours, you know, to meet us and everything. Um, it's a blessing that he that he would do that. So I'm looking forward to that, and him and his wife, and and um, the the Lord's really grown them in the faith over the last six months, and it's neat to see. I'll tell you, I don't have time to get into, it, but I I everything, but I had a great testimony sent to me. Some of you read that on that old past thread that's an instant messenger thread but um, that's on Facebook. But there, I had a, an email sent to me from a lady over in England. And this lady, wow, does she ever have a testimony. Whew. I mean, she grew up in a Muslim home. And she said she was into mysticism. And was that neat mysticism and like like she saw spiritual manifestations and things like that or something. Yeah, into the occult. She was really big into the occult. Through is, you know, kind of through a, a weird Islam. I don't know what, she didn't really go into it. But anyway, yeah, yeah she, was, she was into some of that. And then, you know, she went to church and made a profession for a while. And, and then her father died and just a bunch of stuff happened, I think she said. And, and her life just got really, really bad. And... She went, then she went all the way the other direction. And what was it Richard Dawkins? Is that what it was, Nate? Richard Dawkins. She started following Richard Dawkins' writings. Do you know who that is? Richard Dawkins is a, he's a big evolutionist. Um, yeah, he's a real piece of work there, that guy. What's that? Yeah, Richard Dawkins is, he's the guy that wrote on about, yeah, the, yeah, he's wrote a lot of things. I mean, anyway, he hates God, basically. Um, Boy, somebody that works so hard against something they don't believe is kind of strange, isn't it? But uh, somebody, something that doesn't exist, it seems kind of weird, isn't it, that you'd work that hard against it? Anyway, um, so anyway, she then she found you know a few sermons from Mike Hoggard, and she started listening to him, and she said that was a really big help. But then she found Stephen Anderson's sermons because she wanted to get back to the Lord, and she found some of Stephen Anderson's sermons, and she started listening to them, and she said that, I'm not kidding, this is her exact words. She said that she was still dabbling in the occult, basically. And she said Stephen Anderson, basically, the way he preached, gave her a cover to stay in the occult, basically, and not come out of that and, you know, and not get right with God. What's that? Because he doesn't pre preach repentance, right. And she said, I, what was it? It was recently, like about a, a couple weeks ago or a month ago, she stumbled across our sermons. The best thing Stephen Anderson ever did for me was to put a video out refuting me. Man, I love that. That was great. But anyway, <laughs> what? without quoting me one time, by the way. But uh, I really appreciate that video. It has like 7,000 views on it now or something like that. And I keep getting people emailing me saying, hey, I found you through Stephen Anderson. <laughs> hey, that's great. 
<laughs> that's great you know <laughs> yeah so anyway but he but uh, i was blessed by it but anyway uh she said that that gave her cover and then she found our sermons and then the lord just broke her pretty much and she got saved and she said that that she knows that she's saved now and she said that she heard some sermon then she heard our sermons on hollywood and then that really convicted her and then she threw all her movies away and everything and said how could i be you know i don't want to be a hypocrite you know and and the lord started started seeing fruit in her life you know of of, uh, of a changed life what the lord had done with her and now she wants to serve the lord now i have a friend a lady that has supported this ministry our ministry here before uh in england and she's only about an hour away from her and she travels through there all the time back and forth so this this lady that got saved recently just requested she goes i don't have anybody here i don't know what to do i don't have any other friends you know that are sold out christians and everything so she uh, i told her that i would put her in touch with jean brooks uh, who's a, a lady that follows our ministry very closely she's been very supportive of our ministry and everything and very kind lady and she uh, is going to contact her and get in touch with her so she can be an encouragement to her. So it's pretty exciting to see what the Lord's doing there. But it, the testimony is way better than what I presented it as because you'd have to read it to really understand it. But uh, it's amazing to see what the Lord has done in her life. That's how important it is, though, that we continue to do all these online ministries and get the truth out there to as many people as we can. And God is using that. We need to help these people because, you know, there's there's just a couple people that have been saved. One we're going to go see tomorrow night and another one that was you know, uh, we never went all the way over in England that you wouldn't, I mean, you know, you'd never see them. So, you know, praise the Lord for the, for God using the internet for that. Amen. And uh, we thank the Lord for that. And, and we need to continue to, to use that, you know, as a blessing. Hey, dad, can you grab me? Another, can somebody grab me another water? One of you guys there, please. Um, but uh, anyway, so praise the Lord for that. We better get going here and get started. But uh, uh, just again, pray for us, pray for the guys as they're going to be preaching at the Sodomite uh, event here this weekend. I wish I was going to be here with you guys, but, uh, you know, I, I'll be praying for you, and you pray for us as we're down in Atlanta, in that Atlanta area of preaching. It's going to be rather interesting, I think, taking the half-mile hailer with. Amen. So, and that's going to be an interesting area. There's quite a few people that are going to be down in that area that, are kind of want to meet up and everything. I've talked to a few of them, so uh, through email and everything, corresponded with them and everything. They would like to be there. They would also like to be there for preaching on Sunday. So we're trying to work all that out too, to where we'll be able to have some people there and, and everything. It'll be fine, but we just got to figure out some things. And they want to be there for because we're going to be preaching all day there on Sunday, um, Brother Russ and I. So look forward to that and everything and and uh, whoever the Lord brings in our way and just being a blessing to those brethren down there. And uh, you just pray for safety for Brother Jim Wilford as he travels and his family as they travel to um, uh, to from Texas there to, to uh, Atlanta. So pray for their safety and everything like that. So we look forward to the Lord using it, and uh, we're pretty excited about uh, everything. So you just pray for safety and good travels and, and just good spirit of all and, and let the Lord uh, do his work there. We're excited about what the Lord wants to do and looking forward to being down there in that area. And... Uh, even though it's probably going to be hot. Right, Brother Lee? I think it's going to be in the 90s or something. I don't know. What's that? I'm sure, yeah. So, anyway. All right, well, open your Bibles up to 1 Samuel chapter 16, please. We're going to get going here. Brother Andrew's here, so I can get started now. We're waiting for you, Brother Andrew. Usually it's Lee, but this time it was you. First Samuel chapter 16. All right. Now, this will be this will be kind of interesting here tonight for you, I hope, and I hope it'll show you. <clears throat> all this is going to do is prove uh, the Bible's true 100 percent. I mean, we already know that without this, but what it does is just shows you just evidence in science and evidence in this world that. Uh, the Bible knew long, God God wrote long ago what music was about and what music would do and the capabilities of it. God told us it took scientists many, many, many years to figure it out, but it didn't take God. God is God. He already knew, amen? And he already warned us in his word about music. But this this message is called Musical Suicide, 
the wrong music can kill you. And uh, I want you to think about it. And uh, it's, it's funny, Brother Paul just told a story about that, about music. He said something about somebody who wanted to play acid rock or something like that. You know, he said, no, I don't want to hear that, right? That's what he called it, acid rock. I don't know, what do you call it, Brother Nate? Is it something else? Don't hate on his acid rock title. He don't care what it is. Is no acid. Yeah. That's right. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's right. Your hippie music there, Nate. He used to be into. Yeah, I never. I wasn't a dirtbag like that. I never listened to any of that stuff. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I just stole that line from Lee. It's seven years old, but it's still good every time I bring it up. I just, I just. It's great. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I'm so glad you did, though. I'm so glad you did. I really am. First uh, Samuel chapter 16, verse number 14. Uh, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. You know, there, there's so much there in that just that one that one verse right here that throws off a lot of people's theology when you read that, because you're thinking, wait a minute, the evil spirit came from the Lord? That's what it says. Right? All right. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Man, it's pretty bad when they can look at you, when somebody can look at you and say, man, you got a bad spirit, <laughs> something wrong with you. God must have sent you a bad spirit, Saul. There's something wrong with you. Something's going on there. Right? They can see it. By the way, you know, you can see those things sometimes in people. When you know something's not right, when they got a bad spirit about something, you can see it. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on, a, on an harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Well, that's interesting, isn't it, right there? Because what do we see? We see that, God, that, that music has an effect on people. And, it, it, and music is not neutral. There are so many people in this world, they want to tell you music is neutral. No, it isn't. Can't be. It's impossible. It's not possible for music to be neutral. We're going to prove that tonight just a little bit. We'll have a message down the road that covers just that specifically. But we're going to talk enough about that tonight to prove to you that music's not neutral. This proves right here music's not neutral. But then that's not enough. Let's, uh, let's read verse number 23. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. About that. So what happened there? We see that there was, a, there was an evil spirit upon him, that the right kind of music was played, right? I guarantee it wasn't this next kind of music, because it was completely opposite. It was a music that gave peace to his heart, right? By the way, I've experienced this myself. When, when you're in a bad mood or you got a lot going on or something like that, you're very tense or you feel like you're under some kind of oppression or something like that, you play some good music, some good biblical Christ-honoring music, and it affects you. But I've also experienced it the other way where I've been around people that are playing that music constantly, that wicked music, and you're stuck around them, and it puts you in a bad mood when you listen to it. Now turn to Exodus chapter 32. This is going to prove that music, from the other side, that music is not neutral. And we're going to show some examples. After this, we're going to show some examples of music and society and what it's done. And even what scientists say about music. But we take our authority right from the Word of God. We don't even care what science says. We care what the Bible says. But you know what? When science agrees with the Scriptures, why not use it? Because the Scriptures are the authority. Amen. Exodus chapter 32, verse number 17. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Wow. So Joshua thought what? By the music he had heard and the shouting that he had heard and the beats that he had heard and everything that he had heard, what did he, get, what did he derive from that? Oh, man, there's a war going on down there. 
what Moses say. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. Man, so wait a minute. What Joshua thought was, is man, there's a war going down on. It sounds horrible down there. What did Moses say, though? He said, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. The noise of them that sing do I hear. Wait a minute. So all that racket and those beats and those drums and all that stuff that was going on sounded like war, right? Well, you know, you've heard of war drums, right? You've heard of that, right? Everybody's heard of that, right? Well, that's what he heard. But Moses says, no, that's not what it is. He said, and it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them from them beneath the mount. What, what happened there? Well, he said, you made them naked. You said, You've made your, you made these people naked. What were they having? They were having a good old, uh, na or a uh, bad old nasty party is what they were having. And they had all the music there. They had their own little rave and rock concert going on down there, didn't they? Go back and listen to that sermon I preached called Israel when Israel had a rock concert. Go back and listen to that one. That's what it was. That's all it was. Same music, same spirit, same thing going on where one thought it was war. Moses says, no, nah, I know what that is. I grew up in Egypt. I know exactly what that is. I, I grew up around Pharaoh and all these. I know what that music is. I know exactly where that stuff comes from. You can't escape that Babylonian spirit. How about that? Isn't that a Babylonian spirit, isn't it? Think about it. That mystery of iniquity, that same spirit. Father, Lord, I just pray you'd bless us now, Lord Jesus. I pray that you'd help us in your word, Lord, to understand this, Lord, as we, as we also look at science and these other things, Lord. But we know that you've just told us, Lord, that music's not neutral by the examples you've given us in Scripture. Lord, help us understand that. Dear God, help us understand there, there's musical suicide. There's music that leads to suicide, to death. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, to say that music is neutral is a very foolish statement to make. When we see from the Bible what the Bible says about that, what does that music bring that's not godly music, that's full of beats and syncopation and everything else? What does it bring? What does that music bring? It basically brings what, what the world calls sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's what it brings. That's what it's popular around it. That's the attitude that's popular around it. It's absolute rebellion to God. That's what it is. It is absolute rebellion to God. You know, there's a wrong music, though, that can lead to death. We've seen that. We've seen that a music that leads to life and, and, and that leads to a, a peace. And then we've seen one that leads to war and destruction and sin. Scientists also have proven music's effect, though. I'm going to read you some things taken from Terry Watkins' article. It's a very good one, by the way. It talks about is music neutral in this article, but it's a very good article that deals with music and deals with what scientists have found. And then I'm going to show you some other examples as well as that. And I'm going to tell you, most a lot of people that commit suicide, they're very big into music. They are hugely into music, big time. And, it, and the music they're into affects them. And by the way, we're going to start with the music, and then we're going to talk about the lyrics. Right now, we're just talking about the beats and everything else. Then at the end of this message, we'll actually get into the lyrics of people that have committed suicide and just what they were listening to, pounding over and over and over and over, and they're already depressed, depraved, demonic minds. See, they all were. If you're paying attention, you'll see what's going on here. I started you out last Wednesday night on suicide, whether a Christian commit, will commit suicide or not. And then we talked about psychotropic suicide and the drugs that are attached to that. And now we're getting into music because music is a drug. It is. It's a drug. It absolutely is. All right. So, no, uh, th this material does not even scratch the surface, he says, of the enormous amount of material that he has found with little effort on the effects of music. It is also worth mentioning that most of the following materials, not from a Christian perspective, which is very important for this case because most people say, well, that's just an independent, fundamental, mean Baptist preacher that's saying all that stuff, right? Nah, usually I don't even like using those sources, to be honest with you. I like using their own words against them. See, I like taking the world's words and using them against them. Yeah. 
And it's so easy to do. Most preachers don't ever do it, though. But if you would actually do it, and it, you would give people the duh factor. That's why people get upset. Duh! Right? That's why people don't like that. Oh, that's sarcasm. You better believe it is, because it's so remedial and foolish that we even have to compare some of these things that you have to give what's called the duh factor sometimes. So people are saying, well, yeah, I mean, you can't play with this stuff and not die. But see, when you're in the mix of all that stuff and you're playing around with it, you're flirting with the devil, you can't preach against the devil. And that's why the devil don't get preached against that much. That's why his kingdom don't get preached against. Because there's preachers too busy flirting with them. That's why. You wake yet? All right. And when we refer to music, we're referring to the score of the composition and not the lyrics. Music affects the human body in subtle but powerful ways. A well-established fact is the human body and mind can be controlled and altered with music. Sounds crazy. No way, right? Oh. Many scientific and medical studies have proved conclusively the tremendous effects of music upon the human physiology and anatomy. Music is used to lower blood pressure. Treat mental illness, depression, mental retardation, insomnia, and many others. Musicologist Julius Portnoy found that not only can music change metabolism, affect muscular energy, raise or lower blood pressure, and influence digestion, but it may be able to do all these things more successfully than any other stimulants that produce these, those changes in our body, depending on what kind of music. It's called the secret power of music. You know, I'm not going to get into this tonight, but there are some that believe that before the flood, okay, that, that, that even the, that when the stars sang, okay, that helped harmonize man, eh, the, the way that God made him and everything like that, and the communication with the heavens and everything else, just helped harmonize him. There are many people that believe that. Uh, listen, go back and listen to Carl Baugh. Uh, Carl Baugh did a study. I don't recommend all this stuff or anything, but some of his creation stuff. Carl Baugh did a study about that where he talked about you know, the, the firmament, and he talked about how the stars sang, how the Bible says the stars sang, or whatever, and, and there's just a lot to that anyway. You can, you can listen to that, but it's kind of an interesting thing. Clinical researchers at UCLA School of Nursing in Los Angeles and Georgia Baptist Medical Center in Atlanta, hey, a Georgia Baptist Medical Center, found the premature babies gained weight faster and were able to use oxygen more efficiently when they listened to soothing music. Wait a minute, so you wouldn't take heavy metal music in there, right? You wouldn't take death metal in there and play that for a baby? No, I guess you wouldn't. Why? Because it would scare them and probably give them a heart attack. That's why. Just like it messes with your heart. Think about it. At Baltimore St. Agnes's Hospital, classical music was provided in the critical care units. Half an hour of music produced the same effect as 10 milligrams of volume. Hmm. says Dr. Raymond Barr, head of the coronary care unit. The great pianist and composer of the 1800s, Frederick, is it Chopin or Chopin? 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 Okay. Thanks. Chopin, whatever his name is. Anyway, he was a great guy, I guess. At the age of 10, was often summoned to play for the Grand Duke Constantine, governor of Poland. The Duke had reoccurring seizures of madness, which could seemingly be controlled only by his music. When the little boy played, the seizures abated and the governor could resume his normal activities, only to send for him again when the musical medicine wore off. Think about it. Well, the Bible said it, didn't it, right? There's an evil spirit that came upon him. What happened? David played, and what happened? How does music help? Some studies show it can lower blood pressure, basal metabolism, and respiration rates. Thus, lessening physiological responses to stress. Other studies suggest music may help increase production of endorphins, natural pain relievers, salivary immunoglobin, whatever that is, speeds healing, reduces the danger of infections, and controls the heart rate. Studies indicate both hemispheres of the brain are involved in processing music. Dr. Sachs explains the neuro neurological basis of musical responses is robust and may even survive damage of, to both hemispheres. Music has a healing aspect to it. To the question, does music affect man's physical body? Modern research applies in the clear affirmative. There is scarcely a single function of the body which cannot be affected by musical tones. The roots of auditory nerves 
are more widely distributed and possess more extensive connections than those of any other nerves in the body. Investigations have shown that music affects digestion, internal secretion, circulation, nutrition, and respiration. Even neural networks of the brain have been found to be sensitive to harmonic principles. David Tame, The Secret Power of Music, page 136. Music can also be dangerous to the body. So it's not neutral. We see, we see a positive one when the music is soothing and the music is right and the music is in the right, uh, has the right syncopation, harmony, and everything else. And it's not full of that. It's not full of beats and drums and everything and rock music. What happens when it isn't? Dr. Adam Kinizet, a, muse, a musicologist who studies the effects of music upon people, noted this. It's really a powerful drug. Music can poison you. It can lift your spirits or make you sick without knowing why. Rock music can literally kill you. The, music that mu the, the view that music is amoral or neutral with no inherent power to affect is completely proven false by extensive research performed on plant life. Rock music with its hard driving beat played to plants will kill the plants. Makes sense. Also gives you another, uh, it makes you wonder if that was part of plant growth and everything with the music and the stars and everything coming down, like has been talked about, like maybe that had an effect on plants as well. You know, that, that that caused greater growth and everything, and then when everything changed, it was different, obviously. But it's interesting. While soothing classical music causes the plants to grow twice as fast. Lee, you better get some music out in that garden. That's right. Paradoxal, as it may seem, music's effect upon the more primitive vegetable kingdom is one of the most convincing methods of all for proving that music does affect life, including human life. For experiments conducted with humans and even to some extent with animals have the extra factor of the mind to contend with. This means that while men or animals may be demonstrated to have been affected by tones, the effect may not have been a direct or objective one. Rather, the effect upon the body may have been caused by the mind's subjective reaction to the music heard. In the case of the plant music research, however, psychological factors cannot rely, really be said to be present. If music can show an effect, show, be shown to affect plants, then such effects have to do to the objective influence of the tones directly upon the cells and processes of life form. You think about that now, okay? It's not a psychological effect there, even, with that point, because, I mean, there's nothing there like that, okay? But what is it? It has an effect on its growth and on its life of that plant. But we somehow think that we can listen to the most rot gut, garbage, devilish music in the world that's not going to affect your life? you got born-again Christians that are listening to worldly, trashy music, and they claim to be saved, and they'll argue with you so much, and they enjoy that music, it doesn't bother them a bit. But if you're a saved child of God, that music's going to bother you. If you're walking in the Spirit, if you, if you learn what it's about, it's going to bother you. I don't see how it can't bother you. It definitely affects you whether you realize it or not. And scientifically, don't fine if you don't want to take the authority of the Scriptures, which means you're a really sad Christian, but what about science? Science even proves it. And I guarantee you, these scientists don't want to prove the Bible one bit. An intensive series of studies carried out by Dorothy Redelock of Denver, Colorado, demonstrated the effects of different kinds of music on a variety of household plants. The experiments were controlled under strict scientific conditions, and the plants were kept within large, closed cabinets on wheels in which light, temperature, and air were automatically regulated. Three hours a day of acid rock. There you go, Paul. There's the acid rock. Three hours a day of acid rock played through a loudspeaker at the side of the cabinet was found to stunt and damage squash plants, philodendrons. Yeah, exactly. And corn in under four weeks. It damaged all those plants. Damaged all of it. Mrs. Redlick played the music of the two different Denver radio stations to two groups of petunias. Playing to petunias. The radio's... Great. The radio stations were KIMN, a rock station, and 
K-L-I-R, a semi-classical station. The Denver Post reported the petunias listening to the, to the rock station refused to bloom. Those on the KLIR developed six beautiful blooms. By the end of the second week, the KIMN petunias were leaning away from the radio. Even a plant is smarter than some people. Right? The plant's like, get this stuff away from me. It's poison. You're killing me with this stuff. Literally. By the end of the second week, the petunias were leaning away from the radio and showing very erratic growth. The petunia blooms hearing the classical music were all leaning toward the sound. Within a month, all plants exposed to rock music died. Killed the petunias. What do you think it's doing to the brain and the hearts of people? Man, rock music and that wicked, disgusting, foolish music that's played in the world today, all of it, whether it's rap, whatever it is, all those beats and all that garbage, all that is doing is leading men to hell. It's death, that's what it is. And I don't care how soft it is or whatever you call soft rock or whatever the, the different kind of it doesn't matter. It all leads to the same place. But you know what? I'm going to tell you something. It's an idol for so many people that they won't smash that idol and break it up and throw it in the book. They, they won't do that, will they? No, they'll keep that idol. They'll hold on to it because they love it more than they love God. That's why. So people can't give up that rock music. Why? Because they're addicted to it because it's a drug and they are addicted to it. They are addicted to it. In another experiment conducted over three weeks, the same lady played the music of Led Zeppelin and Vanilla Fudge. I don't know who Vanilla Fudge is. <laughs> to one group of beans, squash, corn, and morning glory, and colus, whatever that is. What's that, Lee? C-O-L-E-U-S? You know what that is? Okay. She also played contemporary avant-garde atonal music to a second group, and as a control, played nothing to a third group. Within 10 days, the plants exposed to Led Zeppelin and Vanilla Fudge were all leaning away from the speaker. Didn't like Stairway to Heaven, right? Right? Leaning away. Why? Because, like I said, even a plant's smart enough to realize it's going to kill them. It's going to destroy it. But you know what? Humans are the only beings that want to commit suicide. It's against nature. You understand? It's against nature to want to end your own life. But you get people hooked on music and hooked on drugs and depression and everything else, they'll take their own life. See, not everybody. Nah, but their life is, is bad enough as it is when they're not wanting to kill themselves because it leads to death. After three weeks, they were stunted and dying. The beans exposed the new music, leaned 15 degrees from the speaker, and were found to have middle-sized roots. The plants left in silence had the longest roots and grew the highest. Further, it was discovered that plants to which placid devotional music was played not only grew two inches taller than plants left in silence, but also leaned towards the speaker. All the plants that were next to the rock music leaned away from the speakers, trying to get away from the music. And to show that it was not just the noise itself, the plants next to the classical music leaned towards the speakers, actually trying to get closer to the music. So do you think music is neutral? Rock music, not the lyrics, just the music has been scientifically proven to literally kill. As some, and some Christians actually believe that the giver of life, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the author and God of rock and roll. The one that made the plants and life itself is the author of a killer, rock music. What could be more ridiculous? Jesus Christ said in John chapter 10 and 10, the thief cometh not for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. 
John 14, 6 says, say, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Christian rocker Larry Norman expects you to take him seriously when he falsely claims rock music comes from God through the church. Christian rock band Petra has the gall to sing, God gave, rock, God gave rock and roll to you. If you love the sound and don't forget the source, you can love the rock and let it free your soul. God gave rock and roll to you. Gave rock and roll to you. Put it in the soul of everyone. It's the Christian rockers, right? There's no difference except CCM is more dangerous than Metallica. Way more dangerous. CCM is way more dangerous than Metallica or any of those other groups. You already know who Metallica is. These CCM, these contemporary Christian music artists, you know, they're deceiving so many people it's sick. They're bringing on the One World Church. We've already talked about that. Go back and listen to those sermons. Music by the arrangement of rhythms, tones, and harmonics can have, a deadly, can have deadly effects. David Thames writes, David Thames writes, in the secret power of music. In conclusion, we can say that in so far as the physical body is concerned, the notion that music has no effect upon man or that all music is harmless is absolutely an error. By the way, rock music can literally cook an egg. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Dr. Earl Flosdorf and Leslie Chambers founded a series of experiments that shrill sounds projected into a liquid media co coagulated proteins a recent teenage fad was that of taking soft eggs to rock concerts and placing them at the foot of the stage. Midway through the concert, the eggs would be eaten hard-boiled as a result of the music. Amazingly, few rock fans wondered what the same music might do to their bodies. You're literally cooking your brain with that garbage. Bob Larson writes, the day the music died, he said this, perhaps you have seen the demonstration of the breaking of glass by synchronizing high-frequency vibrations with the vibrations of the chemical combination of the molecules in the glass. This, in a word, picture is what it may happen physio physiologically to the human body when dancing frantically to rock music. By the way, we're going to move on here to, to something else. How, uh, you, you, you've, we've talked about dopamine before, how dopamine is released in the head when, uh, when certain things happen. When, uh, and, and music is a drug, and it releases that dopamine just like any other drug does. Just like, any, like we talked about those, uh, those um, uh, psychotropics, those other drugs that release that. Other drugs release dopamine and things like that. Other things, pornography releases dopamine. All these things that are destruction and destroying your soul. They release this thing called dopamine. This is from an article at latimes.com. Certainly not a Baptist by any means. Music and dopamine. It says this. You know that feeling, you know that feeling you get when you listen to a favorite part of a favorite song? Some scientists have a refreshingly unscientific word for it. They call it the chills. You know what that is? You've heard that before when you listen to a song, you've heard it before. In the lab, they can measure the chills which correspond with a specific pattern of brain arousal and often are accompanied by increases in heart and breathing rates and other physical responses. Now, neurologists report that this human response to music, which has existed for thousands of years across cultures around the world, involves dopamine, the same chemical in the brain that is associated with the intense pleasure people get from tangible rewards such as food or addictive drugs. The research will be published, they said in this article in Nat, Nat, Nature's Neuroscience. It kind of changes, he says, what it means to be addicted to your iPod. You ever met people that can't go without listening to an iPod? Like can't, they have to listen to music all the time. They have to listen to it all the time. And it's usually the wrong music, by the way. <laughs> why? Because it's a drug, that's why. It's released the same thing that, 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 that would be released if you were taking uh, a psychotropics or you're watching pornography all the time. That releases that same pleasure in, in your brain. It releases that same thing in your brain the same time and messes you up. To find out whether dopamine was involved in the enjoyment of music, researchers at McGill University in Montreal asked participants to listen to a favorite selection of music they brought in themselves into a neutral selection of music they hadn't selected. As the subjects listened, they were asked to press a button when they felt the chills to confirm and peg down the timing of the chills response in relation to the music. 
The researchers also monitored subjects' hearts and breathing rates, temperatures, and other physical responses. They also observed the, brain, the listeners' act, brain activity as their music played during positron emission tomography scans and during functional magnetic resonance imaging tests. What were the results? PET scans showed increased dopamine release when subjects listened to pleasurable music as opposed to neutral music, which is something they didn't know or they never heard before. The fMRI results showed the researchers that the increased dopamine activity occurred both during periods of anticipation of hearing the favorite bits of music and during the listening experience itself, although different parts of the brain were involved. The discovery is significant, the authors wrote, because dopamine response is usually associated with more direct reward associated with human survival, such as food. Showing that dopamine is also involved with our reactions to an abstract aesthetic stimulus, such as music, might help explain, they wrote, why music is of such high value across all human societies. Folks, take a look at it. Anywhere you go, any store almost you go to now, almost anywhere you're at, music is blasting all over the place. You go outside to any event, and music is blasting all over the place right? You do, they, they do a parade or whatever, they got to blast that music all over the place, don't they? They're blasting that music. Why? Because it's a drug. And music controls and manipulates, I shouldn't say music, especially bad music, manipulates behavior. It pushes a certain behavior. Otherwise, why would sex, drugs, and rock and roll be all connected together? Why would that be all connected together? And why do they freely admit that it's all part of it? Because they know what kind of behavior it pushes. That music prompts. Another article, How Music Can Affect the Brain Like a Drug, says this. Drugs are known for their ability to invoke. Invoke. Interesting word. Intense emotional states change a person's behavior and change the way they perceive their surroundings. I'm going to tell you something. This may not be very popular with some people, but that's why I'm very careful about how a lot of people do. I'm telling you. All right. What I've seen with fundamentalism is the same, it is nearly the same technique. If you want to get, listen, I'm not against calling people forward. If, if somebody wants to pray and get and, and, and an invitation time or something like that, but I don't like the romancing music that goes with it. I'm going to tell you that right now. Why? Because I want it to be God that leads you to do that. And I think you've got to be very careful with that because there are some people that will play like 10, 10 songs over and over and over again. What are they trying to do? They're trying to invoke a response from you over and over again. Again, I'm not saying an invitation is evil. What I'm saying is, is when you've got to push it that far and you've got to keep doing it, what are you doing then? You're trying to use music to, to get a desired response out of that. Now, that's not always sinful to play music because sometimes you, wanna, you want somebody to, you know, you want to feel, you, you feel good or something like that. You play some good, good gospel music. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when, it, when, when you're making a decision for the Lord, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where somebody played music to roll or or carry or an offering plate around and 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 play songs to get you to you know to 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 pump people up to give money. I don't believe. I just personally, I've been around enough music to see what people use it for. And I think a lot of that started with D.L. Moody and his and his and his. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. But uh, I think if you trace back the history of it, you'll find out that that's what D.L. Moody did. You won't find it being a Baptist, a historically Baptist trait to do that. You just won't find it there. You will find it in the in in, in the D.L. Moody meetings and everything like that when he hired Ira Sankey to work the crowd. So anyway, that's another story. But drugs are known for their ability to invoke intense emotional states, change his behavior, and change the way they perceive their surroundings. Music does the same thing. Ever hear your favorite song and get really excited? Well, it may not seem like a drug, and you may think that song is just making you happy. Listen, but happiness is a drug too. Technically, it's not happiness. It's called dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical that is commonly released in the brain as a reward for something you do, making you feel good so that you do that thing again. 
The chemical being released in your brain is the same effect as some drugs, the most common one being ecstasy. The effect isn't the release of dopamine, though. Ecstasy actually keeps the brain from letting the dopamine go away. But music affects the brain in a very similar way, but less intense way. It may not be as intense as to cause hallucinations, but it can cause very intense feelings. Bob Marley was perhaps the world's most famous Rastafarian. In fact, the tight connection between his reggae and marijuana brings up the oft-quote idea that music itself is kind of a drug. Steven Pinker called music a cocktail of recreational drugs that we ingest through the ear to stimulate a, ma a mass of pleasure circuits. That was his auditory cheesecake idea. And there's at least an element of truth about it. And not only is dopamine released when we're listening to our favorite music, but studies show it can even be released when we're just anticipating listening to a, a particular piece of music. In particular, dopamine is released into an area called the nucleus accumbens. Acubens. It's the area in the brain that has been associated with addictions. All kinds of addictions. We covered that. Go back and listen to that pornography, rewiring your brain. Do you remember that sermon? We talked about that, how pornography rewires your brain. That's how it does it. That's part of the way it does it. It messes with the neurotransmitters and everything of your brain. And that's how it gets people addicted to it. And that's how a lot of music, worldly music and wicked music, is so addictive to people. Number three, the words affect the heart as well. I think we've sufficiently proven that the, that the music itself can have an impact. By the way, that's why it's important. God, God made you to love music, okay? He did make you to love music. And we should love good music, amen? We should listen to good music. We should fill our homes with good music. We need to listen. The Lord's been convicting me about that recently, that we need to, we, in our homes and everywhere else, we need, to, we need to have more good hymns playing. We need to have more good music playing. Why? Because it's Christ honoring and also it affects your soul. Amen? And when it's, when it's good, biblical, sound music, it's encouraging and edifying to the soul. Amen? It helps set, the, the, it, it helps set the, the spirit in the home and everything else, too, when good music is playing. Even for you, you need to listen to that. It's a perfect example. Brother Paul, when he's in that car, that truck, he said, I can't listen to that. I'm not listening to that. Why? Because he knows what it'll do to him if he listens to it. Drive you nuts and make you mad. But that's the whole point, isn't it? It's just when somebody's born again, they don't like to feel that way. They know it's wrong to feel that way. But we cannot slight music at the same time. We need to understand that God gave it to us to glorify Him with. And we need to listen to it. Amen? We need to be encouraged by it. Because it is very encouraging and uplifting when it's the right music. Amen? So we need to not, not, I'm not telling you don't listen to music because of this. No, I'm telling you listen to the right music. Listen to Christ honoring music. Amen? Listen to biblically sound music. And we're, we're going to talk about that more down the road here, but about music and that. But, but anyway, proper biblical music. We're not done with the CCM series yet and a lot of those other things about exposing and understanding and then what is good music. You know, we're going to talk about that. What is biblically sound music? And, and, and we'll get into that and talk about that sometime in the future. All right, but number three, the words affect the heart as well. We just, we're just talking about the music there. Even a plant knows, hey, i got to get out of here. i got to get away from that. Right? But the words, if, if drugs depress us, and they do, and the wrong music is like a drug that affects us, so will the words over and over again, these rock beats over and over again affect our heart and lead to suicide. Maybe not in everybody, but I sure wouldn't want to take a risk. you got too many people today that say, well, that's not me, I wouldn't fall for that. My friend, you're close to falling for it when you say you wouldn't fall for it. Met a lot of people that thought they were that they were weren't going to fall for something. And then when they're in it, I don't think the prodigal son ever thought he was going to end up in a pig pen, did he? With nothing, wasted his substance and right his living. All right, rock music is full of wicked lyrics that lead to death. If you listen to that with that wicked music and already suffer from depression, it's only a matter of time before that music acts as a lyrical psychotropic. That's all it is. It's like a lyrical, musical, psychotropic that leads to depression and death, leads to suicide. I'm telling you, there are more people, and I'm going to show you here, people that committed suicide listening to music. Many people. 
Between 1980 and 1995, the suicide rate doubled again for youth ages 10 to 14. Suicide has become the second leading cause of death among youth ages 15 to 18. Many rock songs have glorified suicide. By the way, this is from waylife.org. You can find some of these statistics here. Kamikaze clones song, Death Can Be Fun, glorifies suicide. Sting, how about Sting song? Not the wrestler, musician. Consider Me Gone is about a man in despair with nothing to look forward to but death. See, some of you don't remember this stuff. I don't either. But when I go back and look at some of this stuff I listen to, I'm shocked. I'm like, wow, this is so terrible. Because you have the Spirit of God in you now. Amen. Blondie's song, Die Young, Stay Pretty, encourages young people to die before old age robs them of their youthful beauty. The song No Way Out by Degeneration is about the desire to kill oneself. The rock group Accept Russian Roulette, Roulette album depicts two young men playing the deadly suicide game on the album cover. Hmm. Marilyn Manson has sold t-shirts with the slogan, Kill God, Kill Your Parents, Kill Yourself. When asked about suicide, he said, If someone wants to kill himself, fine. You know, chuckling. Suicide is that person's option. From the self-professed devil himself. By the way, um, there's an article that just came out, and I, I, I didn't have time to put it in here, and I don't have enough time to talk about it, but I want you to look it up when you go home if you're on the Internet. I want you to look this article up. There is a woman over in Belgium right now that is going to be euthanized she is a 24-year-old, beautiful young lady, and she's going to be euthanized. There's nothing wrong with her body physically. There's nothing wrong. She's just depressed and said she was a little girl. She's wanted to die. So the psychiatrist has said, because you want to, then I will put you to death. Now, see, if it was my kid and he said that, he wouldn't be doing it. You don't like that? I don't care. If he was my kid and, she's, and he said he was going to do that, he wouldn't be doing it. That's all I got to say. Amen. Amen. He would not be doing it. You better believe it. Something be wrong with his hands so he couldn't do nothing. I'm sorry. That's how real men used to talk. Back when they weren't an effeminate, homosexual, sodomite America. But they'll all run around and rape people in front of you, but you shouldn't talk bold and try to stand up for your family and protect them. Though. Oh, my goodness, that's just too harsh. That manhood scares me. It frightens me. That's how we are in America now. You know what? We're a bunch of whip puppies now that walk around in the corner with our tail between our legs. Too scared to stand up and be a man and say something straightforward. There's a bunch of sickos out there going to murder people. Do you understand that? Get some religion, will you? My goodness gracious, man. I'm telling you. It's, it, I mean, the guy is going to put this woman to death. Why? Probably because she's had devils roaming around her head for the last 24 years, okay? Or last 20 years of her life. And she's possessed by devils. She's probably listening to rotten music. And, she's pro and, she probably, and she don't know who Jesus Christ is, who can deliver her from her sin. But you got some sicko that's going to get paid a bunch of money to kill her. Exactly. You see, that's pretty mainstream, isn't it? I mean, I know it's Belgium, it's not America, but hang on, it's coming. It's already been here. We've already starved people to death here. So, I mean, it's coming. It's coming. The right to die, it's called. It's coming. And hey, they want you off the planet anyway. You're just like a booger up their nose. They want you gone. They just want to flick you right out of the planet. That's right. They've been soft killing other people for years. Poison them every chance they get. All right, I can't talk about that very long. i got to keep moving. All right, Metallica, how about their song here? Listen to this. Lyrics matter. You get that beats in your head. Remember, we already said the music, what it does, right? The sound of the music, what it does. Now listen to this. One young man who committed suicide used the words of the depressing Metallica song, Fade to Black, in his suicide note. Here's what the lyric says. Life, it seems, will fade away, drifting further every day, getting lost within myself. Nothing matters, no one else. 
What did we talk about the other day? We talked about uh, selfishness and just this, this desire about me, 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 me. Go do something for somebody else. Will you go mow somebody's lawn? Go do something, okay? I have lost the will to live, simply nothing more to give. There's nothing more for me. Need the end to set me free. Things not what they used to be, missing one inside of me. Deathly lost. He's right. He is deathly lost. This can't be real. Cannot stand this hell I feel. Emptiness is filling me to the point of agony. Growing darkness, taking dawn. I was me, but now he's gone. No one but me can save myself, but it's too late. Now I can't think. Think why I should even try. Yesterday seems as though it never existed. Death greets me warm. Now I will just say goodbye. Did you hear it? You hear what I said, right? There was a, a young man who committed suicide, used the words of this in his, in his letter. He was inspired. Yeah, music does inspire, don't it, Brother Paul? Ozzy Osbourne, between 1985 and 1990, Ozzy Osbourne was sued by three different sets of parents from Georgia and California, all claiming that his song, Suicide Solution, had induced their sons to commit suicide. Osbourne won all three suits, claiming the song was actually written to lament the death of the rock star, Bon Scott and that it was actually anti-alcohol and anti-suicide. The courts ruled that the lyrics were protected by the First Amendment, and the rockers have a right to artistic freedom. The song itself does not sound like a statement against suicide. Its dark rhythms and depressing lyrics certainly can, can, be, can be taken an encouragement for suicide, and it's an irrefutable fact that the young people have snuffed out their lives while listening to it repeatedly. We'll give you the lyrics of it in a second. The Black Sabbath song, Paranoid, which was sung by Osborne, says, Think I'll lose my mind if I don't find something to gratify. Can you help me? Oh, won't you blow my brains? Two other songs by Black Sabbath, Killing Yourself to Live and Die Young. Suicide Solution, that's by Ozzy Osbourne, says this, Wine is fine, but whiskey's quicker. Suicide is slow with liquor. Take a bottle, drown your sorrows, then it floods away tomorrow's. Away tomorrow's evil thoughts and evil do doings. Cold, alone, you hang in ruins. Thought that you'd escape the reaper, you can't escape the master keeper. Because you feel life, life's unreal and you're living a lie, such a shame, who's to blame? And you're wondering why. Then you ask from your cask, is there life after birth? What you saw can mean hell on this earth, hell on this earth. Now you live inside a bottle. The reaper's traveling at full throttle. It's catching you. But you don't see the reaper's you, the reaper is me. Breaking laws, knocking doors, but there's no one at home. Make your bed, rest your head, but you lie there and moan. Where to hide? Suicide is the only way out. Don't you know what it's really about? Wine is fine, but whiskey's quicker. Suicide is slow with liquor. Take a bottle, drown your sorrows, then it floods away tomorrows. Mm -hmm. By the way, this, this man... We're going to talk about liquor and suicide also. Because about over half people that commit suicide are alcoholics. They're drunks. That's a better way to say it. Drunks. Amen. Mm -hmm. But they use alcohol. Some maybe just tried it a few times or something and they get it hooked on. Papa Roach said this, last resort was his, his music. Do you, do you understand these people that are, let's say they're depressed? We're going to talk about that too, by the way. They're on drugs. They're listening to this wicked music. And how are they not dead yet? And their parents, their parents have no clue what's on their iPod, have no clue what they're listening to. Have no, they don't care. Because, by the way, they're part of the problem, right. not part of the solution. Right. They're part of, we're going to talk about parental abuse and depression and everything else, but, but they're part of the problem. Yep. Papa Roach, last resort, says this. Cut my life into pieces. This is my last resort. Suffocation, no breathing. Don't give a blank if I cut my arm bleeding. This is my last resort. Cut my life into pieces. I've reached my last resort. Suffocation, no breathing. Don't give a blank if I cut my arm bleeding. Do you even care if I die bleeding? Would it be wrong? Would it be right if I took my life tonight? Chances are that I might. Mutilation out of sight. And I'm, contemplating, I'm contemplating suicide because I'm losing my sight, losing my mind, which, which somebody would tell me I'm fine. Losing my sight, losing my mind, which, which, which somebody would tell me I'm fine. 
I never realized I was spread too thin till it was too late and I was empty within. Hungry, feeding on chaos and living in sin. Oh, you ain't even denying it. Downward spiral, where do I begin? It all started when I lost my mother. No love for myself and no love for another. Searching to find a love upon a higher level. Finding nothing but questions and devils. Listen, and you may say, well, my kids have never been to this music. Well, you know what? What do you think I'm up here telling you for? See, it's not enough for you to say, now, don't listen to that. Be a good boy. Just listen to Jesus music. Because I, no, I'm telling you, because when they get out in the world and they walk on there, there's going to be a bunch of wolves on them. They are going to attack them like a pack of wolves. They're going to try to tempt them with every sin they can find. To defile their pure minds. So I'm, told, I'm blowing the cover off of it and showing you the devil in it. That's what I'm doing. Okay? I'm blowing the cover off of it all and I'm showing you the devil inside. It's right there. It's all along. It's of the devil. It's just a different mask. Wake up. He has many masks and he wears them. He wears them in rock and roll, in rap music, in Hollywood, in the world, in every wicked thing. He has a different mask. So pull the mask off, and there ain't no romance in it anymore, kid. No romance. You want to die? Follow that then. You'll die. That's the truth, and that's how you warn a kid. That's how you tell them the truth. You want to end up like that? You follow that wicked stuff, and that's exactly where it leads, because the devil's in it, and you've got to reject God to accept that. And that's why some people hate this preaching. Because we make it so plain that guess what? At the end of the day, you got you got an answer to give. You got you got to answer the question. If the devil's in it, I have to depart from it. So people don't want to depart from it. So they'll just try to point fingers and get mad about the preaching. Because then you know what? Then I can continue in my sin, and I can say, well, no, it's no big deal. That's not true. He's over. That's just his opinion. That's just your opinion. No, I just pulled the mask off for you and showed you the devil right in it. And I'm going to tell you one thing right now. If we don't do that for our kids, we do them a great disservice. And I'm going to show you thousands upon thousands upon thousands of fundamental Baptist kids that everybody just said, don't listen to rock music while they were listening to it anyway when their mom and dad wasn't looking. Because no preacher got up and really preached that devil out of it. That's why. That's why they got into drugs and everything else, because no preacher stood up and preached a devil out of it and told them the truth. You want to end up? Let's go down to it. Let's go down to a drug rehabilitation center. You want to go look at it? How about I take you to the morgue and show you kids at OD? You want to see it? You want to, you want to be in the world? That's where the world leads, kid. That's where it leads. You ain't gonna blame this preacher. You're not gonna blame me when you get older, kid. If you if you forsake God, you'll not blame me. I gave you the truth. I gave you everything I had. I mean it for everybody out there listening to. I will give you everything I have until I'm dead. Because I know what this world will do to you. I know what it will do because I've been through it. And you may not be that way. You may not make it out. Suicide tendencies. It's called suicide's an alternative. Sick of people, no one's real. Sick of chicks, they're all, well, I can't say that. Sick of you. You're too hip, sick of life, sick of trying, what's the point? Sick of talking, no one listens. Sick of listening, it's all lies. Sick of thinking, just end up confused. Sick of moving, never get nowhere. Sick of myself, don't want to live. Sick and tired and no one cares. Sick of life, sick of politics for the rich. Sick of power, only oppresses. Sick of government, full of tyrants. Well, that's true. Sick of school, total brainwash. Sick of music, top 40 stinks. <laughs> sick of myself. Don't want to live, sick and tired, no one cares, sick of life. Sick of life, sick and tired, and no one cares. You know, the devil plays on these kids that their parents neglect them and they got nothing. So the devil plays this tune for them. You know what? Leads them right into the Pied Piper. We'll talk about the Pied Piper music sometime. It's the devil. What does he do? He plays them right over the cliff. I'm going to tell you something right now, friend. If you have thoughts of killing yourself or wanting to kill yourself, it's because you're demonic oppressed. That's why. That's what it is. That's not from God. God doesn't want you to die. He came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. It's not of God. It's not of God.
Alice in Chains, down in a hole. Bury me softly in this womb, I gave this part of me for you. Sand rains down, and here I sit, holding rare flowers in a tomb, in a bloom. Down in a hole, and I don't know if I can be saved. See my heart, I decorate it like a grave. Oh, you don't understand who they thought I was supposed to be. Look at me now, I'm a man who won't let himself be. Down in a hole, feeling so small. Down in a hole, losing my soul. I'd like to fly, but my wings have been so denied. Blink-182, Adam's song. I never thought I'd die alone. I laughed the loudest. Who'd have known? I traced the cord back to the wall. No wonder I w it was never plugged in at all. I took my time. I hurried up. The choice was mine. I didn't think enough. I'm too depressed to go on. You'll be sorry when I'm gone. I never thought I'd die alone. Another six months, I'll be unknown. Give all my things to all my friends. You'll never step foot in my room again. You'll close it off, board it up. Remember the time that I spilled the cup of apple juice in the hall? Please tell mom that it's not her fault. It is, but I'm going to tell you what, when, people, when kids hear this stuff, you think about kids in their home sitting there listening to this, and they're already depressed. Their parents have neglected them. They're alone and by themselves. They have nobody to talk to, and they play that music, and they end their lives. This is not a game, friend. This is real. These are real souls dying and going to a devil's hell for all of eternity, and these kids are listening to this music. I know that the characters change, but the message is the same. Doesn't matter. Johnny Cash actually covered this song. It was originally written by Nine Inch Nails. This comment was left, listen to this. This comment was left below this song title in ShareRanks.com. It said this, I tried to take my life yesterday. It still hurts me to think about, and this is the song that triggered me. I'm 14 have an eating disorder, cut, and have depression. So yes, this is a depressing song. It's called Hurt. I hurt myself today to see if I still feel. I focus on the pain, the only thing that's real. The needle tears a hole, the old familiar sting. Try to kill it all away, but I remember everything. What have I become, my sweetest friend, ever I, everyone I know? Goes away in the end. You could have it all, my empire of dirt. I will let you down. I will make you hurt. I wear this crown of blank upon my liar's chair, full of broken thoughts I cannot repair. Beneath the stains of time, the feelings disappear. You are someone else. I am still right here. What have I become? My sweetest friend, everyone I know, goes away in the end. Now you can imagine if you were depressed and you were on drugs or alcohol and you were listening to this all the time, what would this do to you? This is depressing me, and I'm not, I, I, I'm not on anything. I had some ginseng, but that's about it. That's it. Everything. Some water. That's it. But, I mean, this is depressing enough, right? So how would, you, how would you, if you listen to this, how could you survive this? And the devil knows it. These wicked musicians know it too. They're so full of devils that they don't care because they're making money. Okay, Pearl Jam had a song. It was called Black. A comment about the, about the song on ShareRanks.com said this, I listened to this song once, and it hurts, but I can relate. So I listened to it again and again and again until I'm telling myself I can't listen to it again because it's going to kill me. But I listen to it anyway. I end the night in a bawling, sobbing ball in bed, wishing none of this were the way it was. I can hardly stand this song anymore. Too much pain but I can't stop. You see how the devil gets you into circular reasoning where you just can't get out of it? It's, it's like you, you, you get yourself into this cage and you just get like a squirrel. You just keep going around and around and around and around like a hamster on a wheel and you just keep going around and around and around and around and around. Black. Hey, oh, sheets of empty canvas, untouched sheets of clay were laid spread out before me as her body once did. All five horizons revolved around her soul as the earth to the sun. And there's so many weird occultic things in that. Now the air I tasted and breathed has taken a turn. Ooh, and all I taught her was everything. Ooh, I know she gave me all that she wore. 
and now my bitter hands chafe beneath the clouds of what was everything. Oh, the pictures have all been washed in black, tattooed everything. I take a walk outside. I'm surrounded by some kids at play. I can feel their laughter, so why do I see her? Oh, and twisted thoughts that spin around my head. I'm spinning. Oh, I'm spinning. How quick the sun can drop away. And now my bitter hands cradle broken glass of what was everything. All the pictures have all tattooed everything. All the love gone, bad, turned my world to black. Turned my world to black. Tattooed all I see, all that I am, all I'll be. I know someday you'll have a beautiful life. I know you'll be a star in someone, somebody else's sky. But why, why, why can't it be me? Can't it be mine? In 1987, two young men in Sparks, Nevada, killed themselves with a shotgun while sitting in a car in a church parking lot. After listening to Judas Priest stained glass album for hours, they had made a suicide pact. 18-year-old Raymond Belknap died instantly, while 19-year-old James Vance was permanently disfigured with part of his face blown away. The parents sued Judas Priest, claiming that the lyrics of the album, combined with the grinding, vicious, depressing, heavy metal music, mesmerized the youth, convincing them that the answer to life was death. The parents' lawyer, Kenneth McKenna, stated, the suggestive lyrics combined with the continuous beat and rhythmic, non-changing annotations of the music combined to induce and encourage aid, abet, and otherwise mesmerize the plaintiff into believing the answer to life is death. That is a reasonable assumption, but the case was lost on the grounds that the vile music is protected under the First Amendment, which it is. It is protected under the First Amendment. Why aren't you watching your kids, and why don't you know what they're listening to? You're going to blame the devil? Well, of course he's going to do it. Blaming Judas Priest is blaming the devil. Right? He's evil. He's wicked. He wants you to die. Of course they do. Why did you let your children listen to it? A teenager in Wisconsin committed suicide by hanging himself in 1986 in his dormitory room at St. John's Military Academy. His death was clearly marked as a ritualistic suicide. Next to the body were a human skull and a burning candle. Next to the body, tape-recorded tape rock music played continuously. What was the tape music? It was a morbid album by Pink Floyd entitled The Wall. The very lyrics produced a great depression and promoted suicide. The medical examiner stated this, My personal feeling is that this type of music is going to add to the depression. If they're depressed, this music is going to send them deeper. And if he wanted to change his mind sometime during this, the music wouldn't have helped. What were the titles on the songs of the album? A few where, Is There Anybody Out There? And Goodbye, Cruel World and waiting for the worms. In Plano, Texas in 1983, Bruce and Bill, best friends, listened to a Pink Floyd album, The Wall, about a rock singer who builds a wall around his life to shut, shut out the world. The two teenagers be, began dressing in rebel-style leather jackets and boots. One night during a drag race, Bill was sideswiped accidentally and killed. Bruce kept to himself afterward, telling friends that he would see Bill again some sunny day, a line from that album. The day after Bill's funeral, Bruce was found dead in his car of carbon monoxide poisoning. The cassette in the tape player was playing one of Pink Floyd's songs, Goodbye, Cruel World. Six days later, another boy in Plano killed himself by the same method. According to Newsweek, his radio was blaring the same type of music. In 1975, 16-year-old John Tanner listened to acid rock and smoking marijuana drew deeper and deeper into a depressed state. On January 13th, he loaded his 12-gauge shotgun with a slug and set it against the chimney in his room, his mind filled with thoughts of suicide. On January 15th, he skipped school and listened to rock music all day, especially Black Sabbath's Paranoid album. At 5.15, he put a shotgun to his chin and pulled the trigger. Though much of his face was blasted away, he lived through the horrible ordeal and his face was painfully reconstructed in 20 surgeries over 10 years at a cost of $300,000. Boy, it'd be three times that, it'd be 10 times that much now. By his own testimony, his involvement in heavy metal music quickly led to drug abuse, rebellion against his elders, depression, and thoughts of self-destruction. He could quote the nihilistic lyrics of Black Sabbath's Killing Yourself to Live by heart. The execution of your mind, you really have to learn. You're wishing that the hands of doom could take your mind away, and you don't care if you don't see again the light of day. By the way, happily after Tanner shot himself, he received Jesus Christ as his Savior. Well, that's the mercy of God right there. Just inches away from hell. 
when a 14, I gotta hurry, when a 14 year old ACDC fan in Indianapolis shot himself in the head in an attempted suicide, his mother was convinced that the heavy metal rock music exercised a strong influence in her son's depression. Of course it is. Where were you, lady? How about this one? Now, surely this one, Elton John? Besides being the biggest fruit ever, how could this, how could this how could this ever Elton John right? Listen, Elton John's song "Somebody Saved My Life Tonight" is about a boy who tries to kill himself at 4 a.m. in the morning. Jerry Johnson, an expert in the area of suicide, documented a case in which 17-year-old Alan Stubbs killed himself by running a hose from the exhaust into the family car. Alan died at approximately 4 a.m. while listening to "Somebody Saved My Life Tonight" at 4 a.m. You think that was a coincidence? Remember, the song is about someone who killed himself at 4 a.m. And he killed himself at 4 a.m. Elton John's song, Think I'm Gonna Kill Myself, is about a teenager who contemplates suicide. The lyrics say this, I'm getting bored being part of mankind. There's not a lot to do no more. This race is a waste of time. People rushing everywhere, swarming around like flies. Think I'll buy a 44 and give them all a surprise. Yeah, I think I'm gonna kill myself because I'm a little suicide. Stick around for a couple of days. What a scandal if I died. Yeah, I'm going to kill myself. Get a little headline news. I'd like to see what the papers say on the state of teenage blues. A rift in my family. I can't use the car. I got to be in by 10 o'clock. Who do they think they are? By the way, and, and I mean, I guess that proves enough that what rock music can do. I mean, from the music to the, to the, music, to the lyrics and a suicide, but... By the way, it doesn't stop there, and I, I've got to stop it for about five minutes here because we got to get out of here. But um, rock stars also commit suicide. Why? Well, if you listened and played that music over and over again, wouldn't you kill yourself? Christopher Ackland of Lush committed suicide in 1996 at age 30 by hanging himself at his parents' barn. Three members of the British rock group Badfinger have committed suicide. Pete Ham, leader and chief songwriter of the group, hanged himself in 1975, just four days before his 28th birthday. Graham Bond, one of the prisoners, or excuse me, prisoners, <laughs> yeah, prisoners of the devil, pioneers of jazz rock in Britain, was addicted to drugs and alcohol and was heavily involved in the occult. He was often abusive, cruel, and self-destructive. In May 1974, he committed suicide by throwing himself under the wheels of a London underground train in the Finsbury Park Station. He was 37 years old. Bad finger guitarist Tony Evans hanged himself at age 36. Two members of the Bay City Roll Rollers, Eric Faulkner and Alan Longmore, attempted suicide. Peter Bellamy, founding member of the Young Tradition, committed suicide in 1991 at age 47. Um, there's some, Tommy Boyce, one of the top rock, rock songwriters of the 60s who, con, who co-wrote the Monkees theme song as well as their hit Last Train to Clarksville, shot himself to death in 1997 at age 52. Bruce Cloud of Billy Ward and the Dominoes committed suicide in 1968. Kurt Cobain, leader of Nirvana, blasted himself in the head with a shotgun in a room above his garage in April 1994 at age 27. His body was not found until three days later. Cobain's first band was called Fecal Matter. Nice. He decorated his first apartment with blood-spattered baby dolls hanging by their necks and spray-painted his neighbors with the words, Abort Christ, God is gay, and homosex rules. You gotta understand, folks, this is all about rebellion, but your rebellion will lead to death. You look in the Bible, every time man rebelled to the utter limits, what happened? Death. Rebellion leads to death. There was garbage and rotting food all over his Seattle house when the Cobains tried to hire some help. The maid walked into their house, then ran out screaming, Satan lives here. Wow. Vincent Crane committed suicide in February 1989 at age 45 by overdosing on sleeping pills. Uh, Lloyd Clayton, rock brother of Carl Perkins of Blue Suede Blues fame, committed suicide in 1974. I mean, there's so many of these. Um, some of these we don't know who they are, but it's documented these are all. Brian Epstein, the manager of the Beatles, attempted suicide at least once before his death of the cumulative effort of carbiterol in 1967. You know, this, Marvin Gaye was plagued by suicidal thoughts. Periods of deep depression and thoughts of suicide haunted Marvin for the rest of his life. He always wanted to kill himself. Why? Because you're listening to music that makes you want to die. That's why. And you're playing music that makes you want to die. That's why. It's music that is against God. It's music that is against nature. It's music that works against what is right 
and it leads to death and suicide. So you get these kids that are all hopped up on drugs or they're depressed and they're on depressants and then they listen to this. This is just another drug that causes them to OD. So they just OD on music is what they do. There's so many of these. I mean, there's David Cloud, list them all. You could read more. I mean, there's just Yogi Horton, session drummer for the Rolling Stones. John Lennon and others killed himself in 1987 at age 37 by jumping to his death from the 17th floor window of a hotel in New York City. Michael Hut Hutchins, lead singer of In Excess, committed suicide by hanging in 1997. Folks, it leads to death, that's why. It leads to suicide. It's not just the people, if you notice, it's not just the people that listen to it, it's the people that play it. Right? And there's so many more, there, there's just so many more. You could go on and on and on and on and on, but it's not really necessary at this point. I think you get the point. It's sad, but this is where it leads to. Folks, Don Stegmeyer, leader of Billy Joel's band, committed suicide in 1995 at age 43 with a gun. Rory Storm of the Hurricanes, the group Ringo Starr played in before joining the Beatles, died in 1974 of an overdose of sleeping pills. He was found dead in his home with his head in the oven, the result of a suicide pact with his mother, whose body was discovered nearby. You've got to be one twisted family to have a suicide pact with your mom. It's really weird. That's just sad. It goes on and on and on and on. There's so many. But folks, listen. Music contributes to suicide. You can commit musical suicide. You can. It's proven the music effects and the lyrics effect. You add bad music and bad lyrics to already depressed and neglected people, and they're going to do themselves in because they see no hope. And that's why I'm trying to warn you here, you young people here today, that one day you're going to have an opportunity to go out into the world. You're going to be away from your parents, and they're not going to be able to watch every single thing you do constantly. You know, they're not going to be able to. And you're going to have to show yourself strong in the Lord, and you're going to have to be a man or a lady, and you're going to have to stand up for the Lord. As a young man, as you get out in the world, you're going to have to stand up, and you're going to have to go work around people, and they're going to hate everything that you stand for. They're going to think it's weird. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to laugh at you, and they're going to mock you. But you listen to this one thing. You understand the truth. You understand what God said about music, what God said in his word about drugs, about alcohol, everything. It's nothing but a, a mask that the devil uses to hide in to get your soul or to harm you and to bring you down. That's all it is. Pull the mask off and it's the same old wicked serpent. And that's why he gets so angry at this ministry. That's why the devil hates this ministry. But we hate him too. And we war against him with the sword of the Lord. And he'll flee. He'll run. And the reason? Because his mask is off, and you know exactly what he's about. Musical suicide. It's real, and it happens. When you're younger? From your hometown or what? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No. No, it's real, and you don't know what that young man was going through either and why he did it either. You know, we just don't know. But you have to uncover these things, and you have to tell the truth about them. Because you know what? This is real life. This is not abstract theory, okay? This is real life. Brother Nate uh, had a friend, a, a young lady that he grew up with in, in school, and she killed herself. And she was listening to the same rotten music, wasn't she? 
doing drugs, listening to rock music. She had been through a lot of hard times and abuse and other things. And you know what? She put an end. To, she she took her own life. She was on Zoloft too, psychotropics and everything. She was on psychotropics, and she's and then she's listening to music like this, the worst music of the kind. You know, I mean, it's it's real, and. It affects everybody. And that's why you got to preach sometimes these uncomfortable things. People are like, oh, they're just so long, and you give a lot of facts. You know, I realize that, folks. I realize sometimes it's not easy to listen to. I understand that, believe me. But I really, if I didn't believe God didn't want me to do it, I wouldn't do it. But you know what? There's people out there that are suffering and hurting, and you need to, and we're going to talk about the warning signs of some of these things, too, in the future and understand this. But you know what? When these people withdraw themselves like that, and they get sucked into this music, and they're doing drugs and everything else like that, you know what? They're going to they're gonna take their life. No. Yep. Yeah, it's wicked. If they plug it back in, you need to leave. And take a baseball bat and smash it. Yep. It's wicked. I mean, it's it is a dirty drug. It's a wicked drug. Serious drug is no It is a spiritual war, and music is a part of that war. You know, I just had somebody contact me this morning uh from Florida, uh a brother in Florida, and he said that his next door neighbor OD'd on psychotropics. She had a stroke. She was having a stroke right there. And he was just going to get that sermon. He's trying to preach to her. He was just going to get that sermon that I just preached on that to her to try to get her to listen to it. But he didn't, you know, it was just, but folks, it matters. This is life or death. It matters to God. We need to be diligent. We preach on some, you know, some strange things. I know people probably wonder, man, that preacher preaches on some strange things. But you know what? There's a lot of strange things going on. And, you know, that's right. That's right. That's right. We have to be diligent. We have to do it. We have to be diligent. We have to warn. Father, Lord, we thank you. And Lord, I pray that this would go out to many, many thousands out there, Lord, they would hear the truth. And those that are stuck in chains, Lord, would be delivered by Jesus Christ, who can deliver any man from any drug. He can deliver any man from any trial. He can bring them out. He can make them new. He can wash them in his own blood. Oh, dear God, may they run to the blood of Christ for forgiveness of sins. Be born again by the Spirit of God. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Wow, that's funny. Hear that? Yeah, that sounds pretty cool.